and welcome everybody to this session on using MS Power Apps for 19650 Compliant Asset Information Management. Um, I did email you guys yesterday with, um, if you did want to download or to access a trial version of the software, then you can log in and I'll put the link to do that. Admittedly, the scope of what I'm going to do is around seven key, st key skills, which I think are going to give you enough to get properly started in terms of implementing it. And I will probably tell you a little bit about my own journey in terms of, of, of doing this and some of the motivations behind um, this approach. So let me begin by introducing myself. My name's Dave Shepard. I work for the House of Commons as a BIM project lead. And in that role, my priority is to maximize at, um, asset outcomes um, as it relates to digital construction and BIM. So that's really all I'm about. And essentially, my focus on this has been that I've seen the challenges that people have. If you, if you haven't seen this, then certainly something in my experience, people trying to fill in these um, Kobe spreadsheets. And uh, um, Graham here, and um, I'm going to laugh here, but, say, but both of my colleagues here at the front will be smiling to themselves because they know that uh, between Nigel and Graham, they know that I probably have more to say about it than I should in terms of what people go through. I just, I mean, for me, my concern is that why would somebody want to be on site, you know, and trying to fill in a spreadsheet on a laptop? It, it just doesn't make sense. So once I began that journey, I began to create these power apps, which make it very simple and very easy to develop something that actually can run on your mobile phone. And out of that journey, at the age of, the, uh, of 60, I became an authorized um, Power Apps developer, launched an app on the App Source, and it's all kind of spun on from there. But what I want to do is to sit, my real focus is democratizing this kind of technology. I think it's something that everybody can get into. I don't think it's rocket science. And I'm going to give you some of the reasons why I think that this is the future, as opposed to proprietary bespoke apps or um, you know, full stack developers trying to j develop applications. I think it's going to be people like you and me being able to use low code, as they describe it, to be able to do something useful, okay? So just a very few things about myself before. So as you can see there, assess achievement of key asset outcomes for the parliamentary estate. Um, I always think that self-praise is no praise at all. So when we say the widely acclaimed BIM management handbook, I almost thought maybe I shouldn't have even put that in. But it's out there in all good bookstores. Um, and maybe the most important thing is just to give you an outline of what we're going to cover today. So essentially what we're going to cover is going to be in five key modules. The first bit is what are the essentials for compliance? What do we have to do to make this thing work? What are the essentials for compliance? The second piece of it is just to give you an understanding of how low code, this very simple but easy to use way of developing applications is actually becoming a major industry. And it's opening up opportunities for people who are not programmers, people like myself, to be able to create something that's useful. Then we're going to go into the key skills. So there are seven key skills that I would like to be able to impart to you over the next hour in order for you to be in a good place to be able to move forward with this. I've created a set of videos. Um, I was given the emails of, of everybody who's attending. So what I will do is after this, I'll just give you access to the videos. You can download them and you can go through at your own pace. So please don't get worried if you feel that you haven't quite caught everything. We'll make this interactive. So if there are points in this that it's really not making sense, let's open up, let's get some questions, let's get some interaction going. 
let's not just everybody nodding and thinking, when is this going to finish? <laughs> you know? um, I probably want to look at Power Automate workflows. So apart from the Power Apps, Power Automate is essentially allowing you to create a sequence of tasks which can do things like approvals, can do things like um, generate emails in a particular way, all of those types of things. And it all integrates, of course, with Office. So all of those tools that you're already using, it all integrates with SharePoint. And I think it's going to be a really great platform to you to, to be using. And then finally, we're going to look at some next steps. What are some of the things that you might want to think about doing in order to move this forwards? OK, great stuff. So again, just to remind you, if you do, maybe when you've got the videos and you download them, all you'll need to do is to go to this appspowerapps.com um, forward slash trial. Down, essentially, you log in and you'll have access to the same environment that I've been using to develop these apps. Um, one of the things to notice about that is that the Power Apps is essentially a, it's, a, it's probably the longest running free trial that you'll ever get, really. And there's really a lot of help online. You can go on to YouTube and you'll see loads and loads of videos that just help you to get you know, stuff done. All right, so let's start with the first part of this, which is really looking at the essentials for, for compliance. Now, again, my experts, Graham and Nigel, will tell you that they know this back to front. They can sort of recite it without even having to open 19652. But one of the critical parts of that is section 5.17. And I'm just going to read out some key parts of this, which is around establishing the project's common data environment. And the key parts is that each information container is to have a unique ID based on agreed and documented convention comprised of fields separated by delimiter. Now, as it stands, we know there have been significant changes. So what was known as volumes has, volume has been changed to functional breakdown. What was known as levels has been changed to spatial breakdown. But ultimately, those are the fields that we're going to have to generate as tables which together will then comprise the naming that we're trying to achieve, okay? So what we have to do is create a series of separate tables that represent each one of these fields, populate them with the information, and then be able to bring that together to generate the name that we want. We also want to be able to attach the actual document to it. There's no sense in just having a record and not being able to do that. So I'm going to take you through how you generate that with SharePoint. It's called SharePoint Document Management, but it means that you can actually attach files to the record that matches the naming, and then you can search for those documents and you can open them. Okay, the second piece of this is that, of course, we need to have um, three other key pieces of information apart from the naming, and that's going to be around revision, status code, and also classification, which in this case will be from the PM table in Uniclass. Okay, so we will be addressing that, but as a starting point, I just want you to be aware of that. We're generating a series of tables that represent each one of the sections that make up the ISO, the, the ISO 19650 national annex naming. We then find a way to bring all of those pieces together into a name, but we also need to be able to have these additional fields around revision status code and uniclass code. All right? And then the final piece of this, which is quite important, if you have to have the ability for information containers to transition between states, that has to be a controlled transition. So one of the last things that we're going to be looking at is the ability to bring in an approval workflow that when a file is either added or updated, that it immediately triggers an approval workflow so that it transitions between states according to those approvals, okay? The recording of the name, user, and date is essentially the auditing, which is already part of SharePoint. So Essentially, that's how I have implemented that particular piece of it. Okay. And you can see there, that's the approval workflow that we'll be talking about a bit later. 
And this is really, the, showing this screen is essentially showing you how the controlled access works at the information container level in SharePoint. So the capability is there. And very often when vendors are trying to tell you, well, SharePoint won't do this because it doesn't have these capabilities, actually there's a lot more in SharePoint than people give it credit for. All right? All right, so just wanted to go through some of the key reasons why a lot of people are moving into this low-code world. One of the key things is just speed. You're going to find it a lot faster to be able to create an app than if you were going through the conventional programming route. It just makes it, you've got the templates, you've got the building blocks, you just really have to pull them together. Um, it does mean that you can adapt very quickly, so rather than going back to a programming team, putting in a set of requirements and trying to build a new app, it's very easy to amend and update the app as time progresses. And you need that when you're thinking about agility. And probably some of the others that, the, the key ones that I would probably bring out would be the fact that it democratizes development. Instead of having to be at the mercy of a development team and for them to say, oh, it's going to take this long and there's this much hours, you can actually bring this in-house and probably create something that's quite useful. But what's also nice about it is that you can scale it from where it is as a low-code app into something that's actually far more robust and far more powerful. So it's very important to have a look at those points. So right, we move to this third module, and this is where we're going to just go through this set of key skills, just keeping an eye on the time. But these are the key skills that we're going to go through. So the first one is, how do I create one of these data-first field tables? I'll take you through that. And how do we change the column properties to represent each of those fields that you saw before that make up the overall ID for that particular um, document within the CDE? How do you create then a master table that pulls all of that information together so that you get the overall naming according to the national annex? The third piece is going to be how you integrate SharePoint document management so that you can then not just have the record, but of course you can then drag and drop the file into that record so you've got the association between the actual file itself and the record that you're, you're using in um, the Power App. Another piece of this is generating the concatenated name, so we talked a little bit about that. And then out of the table, you're going to see how easy it is to take a table and convert it into an app. And you can actually just push that into Teams. You'll see the examples that I show you. All of the examples I show you of the app are going to be in Teams itself. It is as simple as moving it to Teams. There's just a button that allows you to do that. You may want to explore and customize the interface. So there's a forms capability which allows you to do that. And then we'll talk about the Power Apps flow which is, as I said, the sequence of tasks which you can automate, and it just makes life a bit easier. In this case, the focus is on review and approval. So the first skill, then, is really creating a series of these tables around the key fields that are used within the National Annex. So I've added file extension because, and obviously I will add in number as well, but I've added file extension here. I know there's number in there as well, but these are the ones that we're just going to create just so that you understand how it's pulled together. But of course, number is in there, and I thought it'd be useful for somebody to put in file extension so that you could then filter the list by file extension. And of course, you need your status code, your revision, and your classification. Yeah? All right, so this is what essentially you're going to be doing. You're going to create a project table, originator table, functional breakdown, spatial breakdown, form, discipline. The number is actually not going to be in these tables. I'm not going to create a separate table for number. You'll see a bit later. When we create the master table that brings everything together, the number will be in that master table. So I don't need to create a master, a number table here. I'll create it when I bring everything together to generate the national annex numbering. And you can see essentially these are the columns. So normally it's the number, the name, 
um, the number of the project, the name, and created on is just automatically part of this. All right? So we're going to be seeing a video essentially that shows us how this is being generated for just these four particular items. I'll talk you through it as we go along, which is creating essentially four tables, project, originator, functional breakdown, and spatial breakdown. What I'm going to start by doing is just giving you an explanation of the interface. So if you've, in, if you've signed up for Power Apps, what you will see is essentially this interface. There's an area for the apps up here, but then the actual tables that you generate are in this area down here. And what you're going to want to do is to create a new table. Fairly straightforward in terms of, of the capability and what you can do with that. All right. Um, there are also some other choices and things that you can do there. So we go in, new table, we type project table. This is so straightforward, it's just so easy. You can obviously put in a, a description. What I should mention a little bit further down here is that you can actually, this is where you're able to attach documents to the record. We're not going to do this now, but I just needed you to know where that is. But it's as simple as that. It's based on single line text, and all you need to do is create save. And essentially, you're going to be repeating that task for originator and for all of the other ones, yeah? Within that table, we're going to have two columns. If you remember, we've got the project number, and then we've got the project name. So we're typing project number. It's single line text that's going in there. One of the things you'll notice there is the ability to say it's optional or it's business required. So you can control um, whether that particular field is optional or required. I'm turning on created on. So essentially, we've got project number, project name, and created on. What we can then do is create the next table. It's pretty straightforward from here. So originator is the same thing. And I'm going to be creating them for every single one of those fields that make up the 1960 650 naming. All of those fields will be represented there. Again, go in there. I'm going to type in the originator name, save that, and then create a new column and type in the originator code. Because, of course, this is going to, it's the actual code that's going to be used to generate the overall naming. Yeah? OK? And again, I'm just going to turn on Create It On and click on Save there. We'll go back, and once again, we'll create the last two tables. So new table, type in functional breakdown. And again, you can just scroll down. There's a lot of other features in there. I won't go through the detail. Um, things like being able to attach um, files to the, to the table like so. But all we do again, same thing again. This is so easy. That's what I mean by low code. You know, it's not rocket science to be able to generate this stuff. And again, we're going to put in the function code and then add a new column. And we just call it the function description. All right? So function is, in a sense, it's moved on from when we used to talk about volumes. We now talk about functional breakdown. And the same thing with the spatial. Probably I should have called that spatial breakdown. But we're doing the same thing. We're putting in a code for it and a description. All right? So I'll just let that go through to the end. And as I said, I'll make sure that everybody gets access to these videos. And then you can go into the free trial and just try some of these things for yourself. Spatial description, click on Save, and we're all good. OK? So hopefully that shows you how simple and easy it is to create those tables. And of course, you'll create them for the entirety of all the fields that are represented, except number, because number is going to be in the master table. It's not going to be generated here. OK. The next part of this is going to be essentially how to create and populate the, the tables. So what you're seeing here is if I click on import, what we're going to do is actually populate the table. Now, of course, the other way to do it is to just sit there typing in all that data. But if you're thinking about things like PM codes, it's probably better to fill in a spreadsheet. So that's exactly what we're going to do here. To populate the table, we need to map 
the fields which are in the spreadsheet, which you can see there, function code and function description, to the fields which are in the table. It's very straightforward. I upload that spreadsheet that you saw with the two columns in it. Right? Of course, the first thing it tells me is that there's a mapping error because those haven't been mapped properly. So I choose map columns. This is not rocket science. This is low code. Function description matches function description. Function code matches function code. Click on Save Changes. It tells me the mapping successful. Imports the data. In this case, it's only four items. But it brings in those four items. And then if I go to Edit, the information is that simple. Excel spreadsheet, fill in the data you want, match the mappings, and you're good to go. All right? And that's the case for all of the fields. So whether it is things like the status codes, you can fill in a spreadsheet, pull in that information. If it's the, for the classification, if you've got PM codes that you've downloaded from, for instance, the MBS website, then it probably makes sense to use that and then just bring that into a spreadsheet and then do what I've just done to import it. Okay. The second skill, of course, is now to look at the table that's going to bring all of these different fields together because we want a proper national annex naming. Notice that the first column is the one with the number. We didn't create a table for number, did we? Because it's going to be in a, this master table. All of the others, you've got title, but all of the others, you can see it says look up, look up, look up. So it's really reading the data from within the associated table that we're going to tie this into. So let's see how that's actually done. All right. So what we're going to be looking at is not to do the entirety of it. We'll look at the, the finished product in a short while. But what we're going to have is a field for number, a field for title, project code, and originator code. But those two are lookups. OK, so we're creating our new table. We're going to call it 19650 um, container naming. And in this case, remember I told you about attaching the SharePoint document management. I'll just show you where that is again. It's a bit further down. Notice that you can control access to it by user or team, but that's what we're going to be doing in the next part of this, is setting up SharePoint document management. Anyway, we've saved our table. So of course, the next stage of this is to generate our respective fields within that table or columns within the table. So this one just needs to be renamed. In this case, we're not going to call it name. We'll call it number. Notice that I haven't particularly changed this from single line text. Um, sorry, I've just changed it from single line text to auto number. But it won't have a prefix on it. it. But it will be auto numbering. So every time I create a new record, it essentially increments the numbers automatically. And then I can choose the other fields that go alongside that. I've got minimum number of digits set to four. But if you are working with five digits, for your numbering, then you can use that. The next column, of course, is going to be title. So we type in um, title at the top here. And again, that's single line text, so we'll stick with that. Um, you can put in a description here. Just makes it a bit more meaningful. Title of document or model, I suppose, would be the best thing here. And again, just save. Low code, easy. Anybody here can do it. All right. Here's the one that's a little bit more interesting, because this is how we're going to start to bring in the information from the other tables. In this case, we're going to say project um, code. We'll choose single line of text and come down to look up. And then what this allows you to do is to go to the related table, which of course is the project um, table. Just go down to there, and you'll see project table a bit further down. So these are all the tables that I've been setting up. And there's somewhere in there project table, which will be selected. So there we go. Project table two, which is the one that I've just generated. And click on Save. That simply means that any of the information that I've put into that table is going to be accessible from here. And then there's just one more. Let's bring in the originator code, because we're then going to use that to build the 19650 naming. OK, so originator code. And it's going to be the same process as we went through before. Right? Not rocket science, is it? 
when you think about the kind of prices that vendors are charging for being able to do these things, it's kind of beggar's belief. But again, we've created a lookup. We scroll down to the table that we generated before, which was the originator table. We choose that one and we click on OK. What that means now, which you'll see in a short while, where it says select lookup, select lookup, look at what happens then, is that if I click on here now, do you see how the numbers from the project table are now accessible within this view? And this is for the originator codes. So in the table for the originators, there will be the full name of the originator, but then the three-letter code to go with it. And essentially, you can populate the table with those numbers like that. This is an example of one that I've generated. We're going to do this. We're going to be sh showing how to generate that concatenated name. But I just wanted you to see what the table looks like once you've um, finished it. You've got all the different form codes. Again, that's a lookup. All of these are, are lookups. Stop for a moment. Any questions so far? Anything that, any questions? Act. Yes, go ahead. So the way that I would probably address it is that it's possible to set up the environment on a project by project basis. Obviously, you can, you can change the project codes, but there are different ways of looking at it. One of them is that you can apply a filter to the table so that you only see the ones that are associated with a particular project. But essentially, this would be a master table across a series of projects but then you can filter it to only show the ones that you want. There's, it doesn't kind of make much sense to sort of have a project table that is only associated with one project, even though you can change those numbers all the time. So, but you will filter it accordingly based on the project you're working on. All right, the third skill. So this is the one that allows you to add a document or in the case of um, when I created this table, for Kobe purposes, in other words, a, a database version of Kobe, um, what you get is what I call the one-to-many problems. If you ever look at the Documents tab in Kobe and see the line repeated again and again and again and again, because you've got six documents associated with one thing, well, this allows you to, do, to apply more than one document to a single record. And essentially, that's what you're trying to do. And to some extent, an Excel worksheet doesn't do it well because it's a flat file. OK? So let's have a look at that process. All right? There are two steps to that process, actually. The first step is, as we said, turning on SharePoint document management. The second step is to go into this area, which is the essentially Dynamics 365 settings and turning on document management here. We'll, we'll see the, both of those in the upcoming video. So let's have a look at that. OK, so the first one is this settings here. So this is settings for the table. And of course, as I've been saying about three times over before, scroll down to here. That's the one you need to turn on. So you just turn that on and click on Save once you've got that in place. So that's the first step. The second one is to click on the global settings and go to advanced settings. And when you come up here to settings, you'll see there's document management. What this does is that if you've created a new table and turned on document management, what this allows you to do is to apply it to the new table. Right? So what you can see is that these two tables are selected, the one that I've just created. And all I do is click on next. What you'll see at this time, and you'll see it shortly, is if I click on Next again and click on OK, bear with a sec, you'll see here succeeded eventually. So what it's saying is that we have now initialized the document management for that particular table. OK? Now, what's the next phase of this? The next phase of this is going to be, how do we generate this national annex name? All right? 
The way to generate it is to use the concat commands. A lot of times we've seen that. We see that, for instance, in Excel. But sometimes when you look at this information here, you're sort of saying, well, CRC0B project code, CRC0B project number, what does that mean? Essentially, the format of this is concat, the table logical name, dot, the column logical name. Now, somebody's going to say, well, OK, yeah, you're losing me now, David. What do you mean by table logical name? When I create a table and I go to edit, this name here is the name that's used in formulas. So that's the table logical name. If I go to edit a column, this is the, column, this is the name that's used in formulas. So to generate the name, essentially what you're saying is, this is going to give me the project number, dash, originator code, dash, function code, dash, spatial code, dash, form code, dash, discipline code. Do you see what I'm saying? You're building it up to create the overall naming. So what does that look like when we generate this? Let's take you through the process. Fourth skill. OK, so we're going to create this new column, which is going to be our national annex naming. Because I've done it a couple of times, you could, I'm going to end up calling it 19650 name, um, sorry, underscore name 2, just to distinguish them from the other one that I've been using. What you need to do after you've typed in the description is here, instead of simple, you're going to want it to be calculated. So you go to calculated, go to save and edit, opens this window. This is the formula that you paste in. Click on there, and it's as simple as that. It literally is. And as I said, the videos will just take you through. The text is there in this presentation. That's how you build out the name there, essentially. So although the numbering is auto number, zero, one, you know, triple zero, one, two, three, that's just always happening automatically. All the other pieces, you're just selecting and bringing those together in order to generate the national annex name according to 19650. Okay. So the next piece, which is the fifth skill, is how do you create the app? Now, most times people say, well, yeah, this is great. You've created a table. That's brilliant. But how am I going to create an app? What's, you know, what's the process? It? And this is where low code really shines, OK? Let's have a look at that. OK. Create an app. Did you see that? <laughs> I know it's really complicated. Create an app. We'll give it a name. And we'll click on Create. Um, I don't know if you need training on this, really. It's that simple, isn't it? <laughs> I, I was telling Igor about this. I, I, did some, uh, I d attended a conference in Latvia. and. and I did, we did go through that, didn't we? I said I love this stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was just a garbled, I think it's amazing, I think it's amazing. So you can see that out of that, all that information, I've now generated an app, and all I need to do, you can see that all of the naming is there, the revision, the status code, which can be updated and altered and so on. And You'll also see that if I select one of these and choose Edit, I get this form where I can make amendments to that. But also, remember what I told you about SharePoint document management? This is where I can add my models or whatever the associated document or file is to that. So I can either use, um, I can either use a Word document or I can just use Upload and upload the associated file that works with that. All right? So it's quite powerful to be able to do that. Yeah, sorry, my tech is, needs a bit of adjustment. It's probably because I've got big ears. Great stuff. Thank you. Okay, so we've now got to the fifth skill. Again, I'm going to stop, because there's been a quite a bit shown there. Implications, issues, what, what, what's going on in people's minds? What are they thinking um, in terms of you know, these capabilities and what it does and so on? Um, 
I know Simon, for instance, you're a Power App developer, and I mean, how have you found, I think it'd be useful to find out, how have you found that environment in terms of the things that you try to do and so on? I find it very intuitive and very easy to learn. Yeah, yeah. It's just straightforward, and there are loads of resources online as well. Tons of resources. Absolutely. I think it's almost like the best kept secret that software vendors they don't want us to really, because if we ever got to grips with this, I think a lot would probably divest of lots and lots of licenses of their, um, their tool sets. Okay, so this piece is about customizing that form, how that edit table is presented. And the way we do it is that we go into the table and we choose this area, which is known as forms, okay? What you'll then do, the one that you need to apply is the main, open this form here, which is the main one. That's the one that appears when we clicked on edit and we went in. That's what, appears, that's what you can customize. So let's look at how we customize that. What you'll see, just a few things to talk about here. You can set up a new tab, which is essentially these headings here. And once you've set up the new tab, the second thing you can do is that you can drag and drop any of those fields that you have, you can drag and drop them into here. So not only can you see the overall national annex naming, but you can see title, project code, originator, function code, all of those can be displayed. And you can put them across as many tabs as you want. It's pretty much that, it's that simple. This is how you actually bring the ability to drag and drop documents in. You go to subgrid, show related records, and then you choose documents. And this is how it brings in a window which allows you to drag and drop documents against that record. So if you've got Revit models that you need to bring in, or if you've got an associated, I don't know, Excel file or whatever it is, this is the way that you're going to open that and make that work within this form, all right? All right. So I've, as I've said there, insert the document management subgroup as I showed you before. You can edit the properties of that and one of the key things that you're gonna have to do is to save, which means your work is saved up to that point. When you hit publish, it goes live. So it means the next time somebody logs into that application, if you've made an amendment or change to the interface, then that goes live to everybody. So let's have a look at that, shall we? Okay, so forms, we said that before. And it's this one, isn't it? It's information main, so not the other ones, this one here. Okay, so this is what the interface looks like now. So what I want to do is actually create another tab on top of the existing ones, which shows status code, revision, and so on. So I've created a new tab. I don't know if you can see it there, but we're going to type in the name of that new tab, and we'll say um, container metadata. So this is going to put in the status code. We'll type that in. And literally, if you type that in, you'll see it updates over there. It says now container metadata at that point. So we want to bring in a two-column tab, and then all we do is we just drag and drop. Revision code goes in, scroll down, status code goes in, drag and drop that. And for good measure, we're going to bring in the national annex name as well, which is the one that we pulled together and concatenated. So we'll just bring in this one here, national. It's just drag and drop. It's sad, isn't it? It's too easy. And in fact, I just want to move it over to here. I'll probably want to rename those two, so I'll type this one and call it revision status. So as long as you've created that field in your table, you can drag it and drop it into your form, and it's accessible and you can update the information on it. And this second one, we're going to dis um, call, I suppose, 19650 naming or something like that. And it's that simple. Save, and then if I want everybody to have access to that, I can hit publish. 
Okay, so just go over to this one and it just hit publish. That pushes it out, so pretty much anybody then who logs into this will now see those changes and updates that have been made. Again, it's that simple. Okay? So if I go into the app now, just to show how it works and how it's been updated, we'll choose this record, we'll say edit, and there's my container metadata, PO1, status code S1, and so on. So we can have that automatically. Right. This next skill is really very much about having packaged workflows. Power Automate gives you packaged workflows. And one of the key workflows would be that if somebody either adds or updates a file in a folder, you want to trigger an approval workflow. This stuff is already created. The templates are there. So it's not anything you're seeing here is going to be based on a template. You can make amendments to the template, but this approval workflow is already created. Now, if you need to create, for instance, multi-approvals, because it has to go through five or six people, that's already built in to Power Automate. And it's important to be aware of that. This isn't something that's rocket science and new when it comes to um, Power Automate. So the seventh skill is going to be to create that flow to root um, the uploaded and modified files for review. So what do we do? We'd you'll notice that there's Power Automate there. It's, it's within that whole group of applications. This is Power Automate. And what we're going to do is choose My Flows. Essentially, this flow is created from a template. So if I go in and edit it, I'm just going to call out some particulars. Essentially, what this is saying is that if you make a change to any file that sits within a folder or below, it's going to initiate an approval workflow. So you can control it at whatever level you want to put this. This is going to essentially route the um, approval into Teams. You'll see that in a short while. And then out of that, it can send an email to somebody, all of those things. So we're going to choose a file. The reason why I'm doing this is to show you what happens when I update. So I'm going to choose a new file. It's going to overwrite the last one, like so. Obviously, the metadata will be updated accordingly, according to that, because we may put in a new file there. And what you'll notice is if we go to Power Automate and choose this, it tells me that it's running now. So the minute it sees that new file, or the updated file, it starts to run this. Now, what's the end result of that? Well, there's two things which you're going to see happen. One of them is going to be that if I go into in Teams, it's now given me this. So the minute it's generated now an approval workflow and has asked me to approve, I'm said, I approve this. What I'll show you is just some of the actions that are associated with this approval. So if you come over here, you can see you can cancel, you can follow up or reassign, but I'm going to approve. What you'll also see is it's tied into your email system. So here's the email, and I also get the ability to approve or reject against that. This is stuff that's built in. This is not something that's kind of rocket science, and it's all built in, and it's stuff that you can use today. OK? So just to do a little bit of a recap on what we've seen so far and so on, hopefully it's pretty clear how easy it is to create a Dataverse table. It is very easy. Generate the table, add the fields that go into there. You can use the Excel file to populate that. So the next piece of it is the master table. As we showed, essentially you can use lookups as well as specific table entries, but then we can use that concatenate and we can calculate and work out the overall um, container naming that's based on that. Additionally, to add a file to that record, you need to enable SharePoint document management. It's very important to make sure you do that. We talked about creating the concatenated name. It's just a formula. And the formula is in the spreadsheet, so I'm um, sorry, in the PowerPoint. 
So I'm happy to share that with you and you, you can kind of build that to your own requirements. Um, generate the Power App, literally create app, generates it. But then if you want to customize, you need to go to forms for the table and under the main form, you can then start dragging and dropping and you know, generate the interface that you want. And then of course, the last piece of this is to create the Power Automate flow, which as I said, it's a package template. And all it's saying is that if you either add a file into that folder or you amend the file, it's going to generate an approval workflow and it will need to be approved before it can go through, okay? This was not meant to be sort of like the world's, you know, I'm going to get you from zero to, her to hero in one hour. But I'm hoping that it gives you some of the key skills, the, the, the building block skills to actually give this a go. I'll make sure that the video is available to everybody who's attending so that you can then try this for yourself and start to see how easy it is to generate these power apps. Um, one thing to notice is that because this app is driven by the data, or more specifically the data model, it's referred to as a model-driven app. So you'll find that you do not have as much ability to customize the user interface. The other type of app where you can customize a lot more is known as a Canvas app. And again, although you customize more, a lot of the techniques that you see here, a lot of those are still applicable to the Canvas apps, okay? But this to me is really where the future is. And one of the reasons why I'm passionate about this is because we are seeing that fire safety information is something that's going to be, there's this mandate around the golden thread of information. And there's a part of me that looks at the cash-strapped housing associations and is saying, will people be paying the kind of fees and license fees to you know, big vendors and what I'm trying to do, I'm actually working with people who have been for housing associations to enable them to start using this type of tool set rather than something that is way more expensive. And you know, at the end of the day, what we're all trying to do is to make sure that we don't have another Grenfell where all of the terrible things that happened, a lot of them were due to really bad information management, okay? Last piece really is in terms of your next step. So I think for me in terms of next steps to build on this, these are some of the things that I think would be, be useful to you and I, I, I would encourage you to do. One of them is that probably there's a need and it was interesting that I spoke to Simon and Simon's already doing this. It's this idea of creating a transmittal which is formatted with HTML and essentially you can then send and receive transmittals through this system. So the expert on that is... <laughs> <laughs> I do. He's, he's going to be angry with me after this. But um, that's really valuable because, as I said in the previous talk, it's very important to be able to capture transactions and not just documents and models. Transactions in terms of who said what to who and when. That's important. The second one, I think, is to take all of that common, column data when you go into the SharePoint, obviously all of that data is not immediately visible. So the ability to transfer all of that column data into the SharePoint data is probably a really powerful thing. I think that's the other one. And the third one, which you can try, is that um, the power up that I've put on the app source is the Kobe data update. A lot of that came out of the idea that I just cannot believe that your installer, subcontractor is going to be trying to fill in an Excel spreadsheet whilst they're on site for all of They're going to want some sort of app that they can just fill in the information, filter it by space, fill in the information that needs, and literally that will update. So it would be useful to try that. So what I will do is I'll put the link to the app source where that is, and you can have a go with it. and. Any further contact around this thing, I'd be welcome to have a chat and see if it's something that's useful to you and um, something that you can take forwards. 
So where are we at time-wise? Oh, not too bad, 10 minutes to go. So what I'll do is on that basis, those seven skills around those seven videos that I showed you, I'm gonna close on that, but I'll probably just open for some questions or concerns, insights. Um, what are you doing today in terms of maybe, is everybody here tend to be working with software vendors in terms of these types of things? What's, what's, what's going on? What are people doing in their respective um, workplaces? What's happening? Go on. That's all right. We have in an organization of 40,000, one of our biggest calls is the O365 community group. And about 3,000 people signed up. Mm. Now, within that, we kind of narrow down the skills level. We track all the skills level of RBI, probably down to about a core of 10 or 15, believe it or not. Mm. And, but it's incredibly powerful and incredibly transparent. Yeah. Yeah. You pointed that man over there on the Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Don't thank me. You know, it's, it's, it's fine. It's fine, honestly. And the other thing we're kind of nervous of because Microsoft did this, they changed their license model. Yeah. Yeah. About a year and a half ago. Yeah. Yeah. And while it's disruptive, it's also a monopoly. Yeah. And there's a real concern around we're going to get locked into something that's cash register for the gates. It might seem cheap now, but at any point they can turn the dial. Yeah, but uh, and, and I actually get that. I, I do understand that. And suddenly you're paying those sorts of fees. I think the... My question would be, what's the alternative? So, yeah, you, but that's what I'm saying. And then you are paying through the nose for full stack developers who are going to be working for years and years. To the, the, the benefit of this is that this is fairly nimble. Um, there is still underlying code that you can mine, but I appreciate that every platform is going to have some sort of freemium level, and then beyond that, you're, you never know when they'll turn it into, start to monetize it. But I don't think, by comparison with the situation of being locked into these proprietary tool sets, or should I say these niche tool sets or point solutions, that probably I mean, you're going to have invested in SharePoint at some point. So I, it's, 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 it's a valid concern. Um, another way of looking at it is that this gives you the starting point for understanding the user experience. But then once that you've found a user experience that works, you then hire a DevOps team to essentially build a solution that means that you're not dependent on that technology if they start to monetize it. So you've got something in your back pocket that allows you to then move over to that if that becomes an issue, yeah? Any other observations or, yeah, Just Nigel. Um, have you, what considerations have you done with the, the revision code and then the, the version within SharePoint? Have you looked at oh, it's, well, in, in a nutshell, the versioning in SharePoint is just, it's a nightmare. It, it's, it's not, the thing is, it's so hard coded that you can't do anything with it. You're never going to make it. That's one of the reasons why I ended up using the table to control that. And I ignore that. So the, the, the main thing, that, uh, approach that I'm taking is to transfer that information from the Dataverse table into a column in SharePoint. And that's what I'm doing, and knowing that I can increment that as I go along, whether it's versioning or it's the full revisioning, I can do it that way, but I, wouldn't, I would never use that. I mean, there are just certain features which, which don't really integrate well. So an example of that would be not just the, um, it's just like the checkout functionality in SharePoint. It, it really doesn't marry well with that. So I kind of avoid it. To me, SharePoint's purpose is to store the data, but not to actually process the data. I'm processing the data through, through these apps as opposed to through um, SharePoint. Yeah. Yep.
Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, and this is full transparency. If you upload, and this is this, so what I've ended up having to do is to associate the record with the, with the file that's been uploaded. But if you try to upload within that interface, as it says, it says that there is a 50 megabyte limit. So what you're ending up having to do is to load the data in via SharePoint and then associate it with that particular record. I don't know why there's this 50 megabyte limit on loading into that interface that way, but that's what it is. So what you're ending up having to do is to marry up that particular record with something that already exists in SharePoint. So that's, that's one of the limitations. And it's what it is, right? Yeah. Any other? They've locked. They've just locked teams down. Yeah. So, so and, and that, that is something that, you know, is, is happening across the board. And then what I do, to some extent, I understand the approach they're taking because what they don't want is just for people to be, for it to be the Wild West and people are just creating stuff all, the, all over the place and there's no control to it. But I think the, the approach that is better is to have a staging area for those apps and then for those to go live. So at least they're being tested, they're being vetted, but then at some point they can go live. I just don't, I think some of it is just territorial. The IT doesn't like the idea of end users being able to create something, you know, that rivals what they do. And, you know, you then find that, you know, you wait maybe a year and eventually their first power app comes out and it's some sort of, well, as, as, it's a COVID form. That's it. That's all they allow. They, you know, they, no, that's it. Nothing else. COVID form. That's it. And, you know, I, so I do, I do feel the pain that you have there. Somehow, we've got to change that culture that says that the only people who can, can do this are full stack developers, because there's so much functionality that we can really start to harness and we can take things forwards, yeah? Yeah. You have to set up a different instance and a different geography for GDPR, which often people don't see. Yeah. And I think the other one that's kind of very confusing is Teams. It's creating tons of SharePoint. People are attaching mm. documents to conversations, those documents will exist forever in the conversation. Yeah. So someone needs to kind of organize the relationship between Teams and information management. It is a bit of a wild west. Yeah. And even channels confuse the daylights of it. Yeah. So And, and to me, the, the way to do it, as I say, is to have a staging platform and then for the best of those apps, if that's just something you want to do for your, you know, small group or something like that, that's a different thing. But for that to go live so that anybody can use it, then you really need that to be vetted and then for it to, you know, to be able to go live after being vetted by the IT department. So. But that just requires negotiation. And that's really the challenge sometimes. If people are projecting themselves as the experts, that's always going to be the, the issue that you have. So I, I'd like to thank you for, for your attention. Um, I'm hoping that this is at least going to get you started. As I said, I will make sure, because I've, I've got the um, email addresses of those who's, who registered for this, I'll make sure that we send out a link so you can download the videos. Uh, I'm not precious about the slide deck, so if you want to use it elsewhere, feel free to. And I hope to see that by next year, a lot of you have at least created your own first app and that you're moving away with it. So thank you very much again, and look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you. Thank you.